here or no? So, welcome this evening. It's not the same which was in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Take your first sheet, and the back of it will be prepared. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Bless the Lord, who called us all holy spirituals to be written for our learning. Help us so to hear them, to read them up there in the middle of the digest them. Thank you, Jesus, for the comfort of your holy word. We may embrace and forever hold fast the hope of everlasting life, which we have given us as our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is alive and made with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit. One more time. Right, that's good to see you all, and thanks for coming along. So, we see these a while, three or four meetings during Advent, but it comes to the third one, we'll decide whether we want a fourth one, or whether you're really um, desperate for more. Um, now, what uh, I do propose is to look at the previous Sunday's Gospel. We've all heard that, uh, I'll read always a few remarks on it at the Sunday sermon. This is to go into it perhaps a bit more deeply uh, and uh, see what's going on there and then any questions that might arise from that to clarify and come to lighten us. Now the method I'm going to use is called Lexio Divina. And then they haven't that at all, Lexio Divina. It's divine reading or um, sacred reading, sacred reading of the text. <coughs> and it's got a great pedigree in the church goes right back to the mid Middle Ages. And they say there, the 12th century, a Cuban monk. And it's used very much still in monasteries and in groups like this uh, all through the church. Pope Benedict XVI really encouraged us to use this, this method of reading the scriptures. The first step is the reading of the scripture. When we think about the text we've chosen, ruminate upon it. And so we take from it what God wants to give us. But what we'll do, we'll share that reading. And we'll do it twice. We'll do it twice, okay? And <coughs> as uh, we read it, I'd ask you to choose a word, or two words, or three words at the most, which strike you, which jump out of the text at you, which uh, either raise a question in your mind, or uh, give you comfort in your heart, and just hold on to that, okay? Because in the second stage is the meditatio of the reflection, where we think about the text we have chosen. And, sorry, the, the, the lexo is the, the, the reading of the text. The second stage is the rumination. So we take from the text what God wants to give us, okay? At that point, we can just share what those words that we've chosen, okay? Or don't comment on them, we just share them, all right? The third stage is the oratio, the prayer or the response, where we leave our thinking aside and simply let our heart speak to God. And this response will inspire a reflection on the work of God. And the final stage is contemplatio, contemplation or rest, where we let go not only our own ideas, plans and meditations, but also our holy words and thoughts. We simply rest in the work of God. And at this point, what's quite useful is to use a word you've chosen as a type of mantra, that is a repetitive word, to still our minds, to, to slow down our brains, and to uh, exclude any thoughts that might be intruding. So that just by repeating that word, you're basically centering yourself and allowing the word to really take root in your heart. Okay? We're listening at the deepest level of our being, but who speaks within us with a sp still small voice. And as we listen, we are gradually transformed from within. And this transform transformation will have a profound effect on the way we actually live. And the way we live is a test of the authenticity of our prayer. We take what we read in the Word of God into our daily lives. Okay? That's all very abstract. We'll learn by doing it. Okay? That's the best way to do it. If you take your second page, and go to the back of it, starts the text, see the text. <coughs> I'm 
we're going to ask you just to read one verse each, okay? Nice and slowly. Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, who has broken open your sacred word to us. May that Holy Spirit enlighten our minds and quicken our hearts, so that we may receive the strength to serve you ever more fully and build up your kingdom in our world. We ask this through Christ our Lord. I'm going to do a bit teaching, if that's okay, for the ten minutes or so. But thanks very much for that. That was, that was powerful. That was powerful. And the church talks of the, the sensus fidelium, which is the understanding of the faithful. A group of faithful together um, will always get to the heart of the sacred word. That is my experience in the past, and that's what happened this evening. That's what happened this evening. The, the, the very heart of, of that passage it was, it was, was unfolded and broken open by all of us together. So thanks very much for that. Um, any re reactions to that, that method? Did you find it comfortable? The silence is uncomfortable or was it okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we'll continue that next, next time. Now, um, I just want to say a, a couple of words about St Luke's Gospel. Ah, I knew I had a friend about something. It's one at the bottom of the commentary in the text. Is that it? No, it's not so much that. It was a about, uh, about, uh, thing about St. Luke's Gospel. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I can give you that next time. <coughs> St. Luke's Gospel, that's the Gospel we're following this year, the cycle scene. Remember, the church followed three cycles, and we're in the third cycle for St. Luke. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, I mean, very basic here, so I'll throw some out there for a few, a few of this before. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as synoptic gospels because they're so similar. You can read them together. The same thing with the following kind of same order, but at times use the very same words. John's gospel is quite different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John's gospel is more a contemplation on person and message of Christ, much more profound meditation of the world. Luke is the, this is the common, uh, Kind of belief is that Luke was the third gospel to be read. Mark was the first, okay? And when Matthew and Luke came to write their gospels, they had a copy of St. Mark's gospel, the written gospel, in their sweaty clothes, okay? So you imagine Matthew and Luke at the desk, and there's a copy of St. Mark on the desk. And that explains why Matthew and Luke follow the order of St. Mark and often at times have the Mark's Gospel word for word in their Gospels, okay? But at times, Matthew and Luke have passages which Mark doesn't have. And Matthew and Luke agree almost again word for word. So they've got the copy Mark there, and then there these passages that Mark doesn't have. So this has led commentators to um, posit another gospel, another written gospel, which they call Q, nothing to do with James Bond. <laughs> uh, it's the first part of the German word for source, quether, real German imagination, your source. <laughs> um, so the commentators say that there, 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 was, there, this, there was this written gospel which has now been lost. And Matthew and Luke had that before them. And that was more a series of just um, words from the Lord. It wasn't narrative stories, but a series of words from the Lord. And they used that uh, in the construction of their gospel. So Mark came first, about the year 70. Matthew and Luke, about the year 80, 85. And then John in the 90s. And John doesn't depend on any of the Scottish Gospels. A lot of material is similar, of course, because he's receiving oral traditions that are coming to him, but he doesn't depend on them as sources, he's like quite independent. And so, the first Christian 
actually to put pen to paper and to talk about uh, the Lord was St. Paul. St. Paul has written, all his letters are written long before the Gospels. So they're the first documents in the New Testament. Interestingly, if we didn't have the Gospels and we only had the letters of St. Paul, we'd know almost nothing about the life of our Lord. We'd know that he was born of a woman, that's Galatians chapter 4. And on the night before he died, he celebrated the Eucharist in Corinthians 13. That's all Paul tells us to live or of the life of the Lord. And that, that's strange. That is, you know, the thought uh, Paul write these communities, they, they want to know the life of the Lord and all that. Now, we could perhaps presuppose Paul writing, say, about the year 50, late 40s, early 50s, it's the first generation of Christians. And all the stories about the Lord have been handed down by word of mouth only. So they probably had, you know, a good knowledge of the stories about the Lord's earthly life. But I think more importantly for Paul, what was important, the event about Jesus that was world changing was his death and resurrection. So Paul is actually not interested in his earthly life. Paul, all Paul's letters are an extended meditation on the implications of the Lord's death and resurrection. And so, you know, and that's why they're so powerful, because the different letters is <coughs> homing in in different aspects of Christian life, the Christian life, you were talking about, etc. Uh, correcting where possible, uh, urging the, the, the followers to greater dedication, complimenting all that, but all came back to uh, the Lord's death and resurrection. And, and that's from Paul we get, in, in Romans and Galatians in particular, that the connection we make with God in Christ is faith. That's the connection. So it's faith, by faith we are justified. And all the rest comes from that, that fundamental uh, act. The time that the, the Gospels I remember, we're starting in the year 70. So the first Christians are beginning to die off. Um, and for whatever reason, we don't know the reason, but Mark decided he had to put pen to paper. And Mark collected a lot of the old traditions that were going about and constructed his gospel from that. Um, and each of the gospel writers are right from different communities of people or different churches, okay? Mark is traditionally associated with Rome, Matthew with Syria, and or Matthew with Judean, if you want, Judean and Syria, and Luke with a more pagan by origin community somewhere in the Middle East, I'm not quite sure. So Mark writing for um, converts from both Judaism and paganism, Matthew very much for a, a church made up of converts from Judaism. Matthew is the most Jewish of the Gospels. And Luke is the most Greek. Luke is writing predominantly for Gentile converts. So the makeup of the churches is actually quite different. And so the Gospel stories themselves take on different emphases. Uh, they have, have different theologies, if you want. Different ways of understanding the person and the mission of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, again, interestingly, if we didn't have Matthew and Luke, and only had Mark and John, we wouldn't know anything about the birth of Jesus. Mark doesn't have a birth story. Only Matthew and Luke tell the story of the birth of Jesus. And they tell that in quite different ways. Uh, Mark, for, for Mark, uh, the story of Jesus begins with his baptism in the river John. So for Paul, the big moment was Christ's death and resurrection. This is when, for Paul, he reveals himself to Son of God. Mark comes along and thinks, well, if he was Son of God at his resurrection, surely he was Son of God when he was among us as a human. So Mark has the declaration of Jesus' divinity at the baptism of the river Jordan. But the Holy Spirit, it happens a ripped talk apart, the Holy Spirit comes down in this voice, this is my son, the love of the him. That's called the crystal, that's called the crystal logical moment 
the Christological moment for Paul is the resurrection, for Mark is the baptism. Look, can Matthew come along and say, well, hold on, if Jesus was Son of God in his resurrection and was Son of God during his ministry, surely he was Son of God from the first moment he was conceived. And so we have the stories of his conception and birth as Son of God. And finally, John comes along and he doesn't have anything about the birth stories. But what he does is pushes the Christological moment right back. For Paul, the resurrection. For Mark, the baptism. For Luke and Matthew, the conception. For John, what would it be? Eternity. 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 He must have been the Son of God for all eternity. And so we then get the, the doctrine of the Trinity beginning to be formulated in a kind of general manner, but it's been formulated in it. So you see how the, uh, the, the New Testament, uh, but the whole Bible, in fact, the New Testament, there are different voices coming along. And it's good if we can tune our ears to the different voices. So for Luke now, <coughs> we'll listen to Luke's birth story, obviously. But Luke um, saw um, Jesus as one who had a special ministry to the poor. So that, that's not the gospel, of course. But Luke really emphasizes this. The poor, the imaginated, the, the ones with nothing. Um, it was called, uh, he took up a phrase from the Old Testament, the poor ones of Yahweh. They were called the Anabim, the poor ones of Yahweh. And Luke really ran with that concept to make it a, a central focus on his meditation on, on our Lord. That's one uh, thing Luke does. The other one is Luke, like the women, <laughs> his gospel is the gospel for women. Uh, if you compare Luke with the other gospels, the, the role the women play in it is remarkable. Starting with Mary, of course, right through. And of course then, um, so Luke is not um, finished when he finishes the gospel. He writes the Acts of the Apostles. Because he sees the story of the church mirroring the story of Jesus. So St. Luke is, of course, is a two-volume work. And his emphasis on the role of women in the church is really seen in the Acts of the Apostles. And you know, if you go through and see all the women mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles, it's quite remarkable. Sort of thing. So the, the, the role of women is, um, is really emphasized in Luke. And then we have Luke developing the, the role of Mary as well. Um, Matthew has Mary clearly. St. Mark doesn't really mention Mary. He's mentioned in passing, but he doesn't really have any strong Mariology. Matthew, obviously, the birth narrative has Mary there, but it's Luke and Luke and then John later that we see the role of Mary and God's plan of salvation being developed. She is the one who heard God's word and acted on it. You know, Let it be done to me according to thy word. And that becomes again a light motif through Luke's gospel for discipleship to hear God's word and then to do it. Again, back to your point, I suppose. To hear God's word, that word coming to us graciously as a free gift, and then to, to, to act on the word. And Mary is set up as a role model for the one who, who really had the word and kept it. And it's interesting if you compare Matthew and Luke. Um, <coughs> Matthew is a story that they get from. They get from Mark, that's right. And it's where we hear that Jesus is inside this house. And there's a whole crowd outside. And uh, Mary and his brothers and sisters are getting worried about it. And somebody comes and says, Lord, your mother's outside calling on you. And Jesus says, who is my mother? And Matthew, in Matthew, the answer is, those who hear God's word and keep it, and Luke is my mother is the one who hears God's word and keeps it. Do you see the different emphasis there? In Matthew, um, Matthew is saying phys physical or family ties don't matter in the kingdom. And that, that's a big Christian insight actually. Mm. You know, the, the kingdom we go beyond family ties. The big kinship becomes comes through baptism. So for Matthew his mother and brother and sisters are those who hear the word of God, keep it us, okay? And, and look, it's the exact same story, but the answer is different. 
becomes my mother is the one who hears God's word and keeps it. So he sets Mary as an example and a model of her Christian living. A slight difference, you know, but you see the different emphases doing that. Um, and another thing that Luke emphasizes, again, he's writing for this reasonably educated audience, and they are living in the Roman world. And the big thing about the Roman world was um, the innocent martyr, the one who goes to his death um, unjustly. And Luke really emphasizes uh, that uh, aspect of Christ, that he goes to his death and he's totally innocent. So as he hangs on the cross, um, in Mark and Matthew, the centurion says, truly this man was the son of God. In Luke, the centurion says, truly this man was innocent of these crimes. So the innocence of, of Jesus, he is the, the lamb that goes to the slaughter on behalf of, of humankind. That innocent martyrdom is on behalf of the people of humanity. Those are just some of the, the kind of wee themes that you will get in, in Luke's gospel. And we'll, we'll hear them as he progresses. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let's just finish with the Our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but the us of evil. Amen. The Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thanks again, everybody. Come back next week.